I'd like to uh, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Ben Rostron. I'm a professor at the University of Alberta in hydrogeology. I'd like to introduce someone who needs uh, not much introduction, a person to my left, uh, Joe Tote, who is a former colleague, PhD supervisor of mine, who now teaches at the Etvush Lorand University in Budapest. And uh, we're here today as part of the uh, International Association of Hydrogeologists time capsule project and the purpose of uh, that project and what we're going to do today is to try and provide a, a live uh, record of sort of the person behind uh, the papers that uh, many of you hopefully have read. Um, so we got a list of questions and we're going to go on for the next uh, little while and uh, hopefully give you a flavor of Joe Toth. So the first uh, part of what we want to do is talk a little bit about, um, about your history, Joe. What prompted you to uh, go to university and, and take mining uh, geology or mining geophysics when you were a young man? Uh, our family, I was a young man in high school in the very bad days in uh, the history of Hungary in the 1950s, at which time for political reasons I virtually had no hope to get to university, but somehow I felt at a ripe old age of 14 that I wanted to pursue a life which I could love every day. So I wanted to go to university to begin with. And after graduating from high school, I uh, went to a big metal factory in Budapest uh, where I obtained a work worksman, a proletar status, and as a proletar, uh, I was admitted uh, to the mining school in Sopron, the only mining school at the time in Hungary. The reason why I wanted to go to Sopron uh, was because uh, one of the well-known Hungarian physicists had a uh, um, what is the what is the name of the chamber, the uh, Wilson uh, uh, chamber, uh, where you could trace uh, uh, electrons flying through? And but by the time I got there, it went. Uh, well, the, the the person went to Budapest to the university where I am currently uh, associated with, and. <clears throat> Geophysics was something that also attracted me so that I remained there as a geophysicist, uh, an exploration geophysicist uh, where, where I reached actually almost got uh, graduated in 1956. However, the Hungarian revolution at the time against the Soviet uh, occupation and the Soviet Union uh, uh, in Hungary, uh, I had to leave the country. So that uh, I left Hungary as a geophysicist, uh, an unfinished geophysicist, and the Dutch were very great to us, uh, seven or eight uh, geophysicists. Uh, uh, we were accepted in, uh, at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. So this is how I got into uh, geophysics, uh, into university. How did you end up, uh, when did you come yeah. to Canada? So yeah. what time are we at? <clears throat> the, Utrecht uh, the Utrecht University had already a very good reputation uh, with the Research Council of Alberta uh, in Canada uh, through Peter Maibohm, mm -hmm. uh, who was a paleontologist uh, in Utrecht, but managed to retract himself into a hydrogeologist. And he knew me quite well. And when I was writing around uh, the world, actually, uh, uh, to look for a job, uh, uh, Peter said that I should apply to uh, the Research Council. Uh, so I applied to the Research Council. And to a large extent, Peter Maibohm's uh, recommendation, I uh, got accepted 
uh, unseen, as it were, because uh, just on the paperwork. So uh, I arrived in the uh, fall of 1960 uh, with two kids and my wife to do geophysics, uh, to, lo uh, to look for groundwater uh, by geophysical means. And for reasons uh, not of my fault, uh, the techniques and methods that I was uh, supposed to use did not work. Geophysical methods in those days were not sensitive enough to differentiate between uh, the valley fills, the fills of deep preglacial valleys, <clears throat> and the bedrock which they filled. So that uh, pretty soon I found myself, since the geophysics did, uh, didn't work in those days, on these problems, I was pretty soon finding myself there with a job without work to do. Uh, because I, I had a employment, but uh, uh, by the end of 1960, it was quite clear that I couldn't do that job. How did you get involved in uh, groundwater? How did the change take place? Much to our benefit, but how did it? How did that happen? Well, my original purpose was to be to look for groundwater, but uh, it couldn't be done by geophysics, which was my trade and background. So I decided I, I had to retread myself uh, uh, to from geophysics to what in those days in Canada was called, actually. Uh, groundwater hydrology or something. There was the word, we never used the word hydrogeology. Well, I got assigned to the central part of Alberta, which you know very well, the, the uh, Red Deer, Statler, Cal, Statler, Drumheller, Calgary uh, quadrangle that I had to advise farmers, towns, small industries for groundwater. I didn't know the first thing about groundwater and uh, at that time, but I had to advise them. I had to run pumping tests, uh, which I uh, learned on the way out in the truck. And I couldn't give you an explanation why, but I got the idea fixed that the only way to do it is to uh, understand the subsurface travel of a drop of water from the point where, where, where it enters the ground to the point where it discharges from the ground. Somebody referred me to King Hubbard's book, a paper, so-called paper, which is an understatement. And so I got a copy of that and was fascinated by it. But with my background in geophysics and uh, some knowledge of uh, differential equations, uh, yes, I enjoyed it very much and believed it, because with such an authority, what else can you do? I believed it and tried to apply the concepts. And there I came to a major discrepancy between the famous uh, figure of King Hubbard, uh, the 40, figure 45, uh, where he sketches uh, the uh, flow pattern in a drainage basin, and on the one hand in my field observations, on the other, King Hubbard shows there all flow lines uh, recharging over the entire surface of the basin into the tallweg of the river as it was a drainage ditch. So the whole, the whole drainage, the whole drain, the whole, the whole flow the system whole basin would ends up drain in the river in, bottom. In that line That's sink right. as King yeah. uh, Hubbard uh, calls it. And uh, all those uh, prairie creeks uh, in my area Otherwise, very diligently following King Hubbard's uh, idea of parallel creeks, uh, so the drainage network type of thing, all those creeks were dry, very little water, you could jump over them. Mm. Despite the fact that the permeability was generally good enough to supply small towns and small industries, the <clears throat> elevation difference uh, within eight to 10 kilometers over 100 meters, so enough of a slope, enough gradient, good permeability, and still no water in there, in the 
streams. And then on a day, just somehow I realized that, uh, oh no, no, that comes after. Then I decided that uh, somehow uh, this discrepancy between my observations and uh, the prediction uh, had to be resolved. And then I decided to uh, try to figure it out myself and write a uh, Laplace equation and solved it. And then when the solutions came out, then I realized the fundamental difference that King Hubbard's uh, uh, di diagram showed not the results, but the assumptions. So that it was a working hypothesis, it was an assumption. Probably he didn't even think about uh, basin or flow patterns. He thought about the relations of flow lines to his newly formulated fluid potential lines. So that that was, his, I'm not blaming him at all, that was not his, <clears throat> not his purpose to describe flow in a drainage basin. His purpose was to, uh, to formulate fluid potentials and uh, the, the flow pattern uh, with respect to how it's controlled by the fluid potential distribution. Uh, so there was a non-issue in his mind, which was the main point in my, uh, my search for the truth. And the answer was found by that first solution that I made in a uh, linearly sloping the uh, basin, the basin, which uh, later on I came to, com uh, to call the unit basin. And <clears throat> That recognition ultimately, uh, ultimately, uh, represents the basis for many other, th uh, many other things to come. Uh, namely, that the entire lower half of that basin is a discharge area. That is, only 50 percent of the entire surface is uh, uh, discharge. Another 50 is recharge, and that there is no preferred discharge area right. uh, in the top. So the missing water, uh, the water that, that should have been in the creeks, that's right. is actually that, coming up yeah. on the bottom oh, half of the, the yes. unit basin. Yes. So that's, that was yes. the reconciliation between them. <clears throat>
And that actually, that already was done by 1962, or October, or November, there was a symposium in uh, Calgary, and in the, in the proceedings of that symposium, uh, that paper and the, uh, the big debate between Peter Maybaum and myself uh, is recorded in that too. Uh, I was really very happy with the outcome, not with the, uh, the debate, but with the results. And uh, you just referred to an anecdote. I don't know whether you are thinking of that or not. But <clears throat> I was working at the time uh, uh, with, a, in those days, well-known Alberta water well driller. Mike Curcio was the name. And <clears throat> I was going out with Mike uh, on a job in early morning. And just a few days earlier, I realized that I got the solution uh, all right and just was uh, very enthused and excited about it so that no sooner I, uh, uh, I set into his car than I started to rave him about uh, my new theory. And my Curcio, as he was a big man and quiet, patience, patiently listening to me, and after a good uh, uh, 100 miles or so, when I ran out of words, uh, then Mike looked at me and said, and asked, gee, Joe, that's beautiful. And what is it good for? <laughs> and then I realized that I never really thought of the practical application. The task to solve was so exciting and so nice that that I, I I was speechless for a moment, and but I was forced to give him an answer. And came up with one which I think I still today couldn't do better. Said Mike, I don't know what it uh, what it is good for, but I know that if I once find a truth in nature, sooner or later it will be useful. talked uh, a little bit about um, sort of the background behind the thoughts that went into the 62, 63 papers. Can you maybe tell us uh, a little bit about um, sort of what happened after that? I think um, the reaction from the inter you know, international community was quite uh, sudden and, uh, and y you were uh, recognized by the Geological Society of America soon afterwards. So you maybe just tell us a little bit about that. Now, luck plays an important role in these events, and uh, I have to admit, I'm happy to admit, that I was uh, lucky in this sense because Alan Fries, uh, a man from uh, Saskatchewan province of Alberta, uh, was looking for a PhD thesis at the time at the University of California, Berkeley campus, uh, with Professor Witherspoon. And it was the dawn of the numerical uh, age. And uh, Witherspoon advised uh, Al, Alan Fries, uh, advised to uh, try uh, to apply, develop some numerical methods uh, for some groundwater projects or groundwater problems. And Alan had read my paper and liked it very much, so he went to the trouble to visit me up in Alberta from Berkeley, asking if uh, I intended to develop uh, those equations and those uh, thoughts uh, any further. And when he said what uh, the background to his question was, then I realized immediately that he would be much better, that I would be much better served <clears throat> if he, with his abilities and drive and everything, would take over. It was Alan Fries and Paul Witherspoon who really put those ideas into the real working life, uh, into the life of the working hydrogeologists, the researchers. Uh, they showed what heterogeneity, uh, topographic complications, uh, anisotropy, uh, these, uh, uh, what effect these 
properties have on the configuration of flow patterns. And second, that they made the investigations of these effects uh, feasible by introducing the numerical methods. After that, it, uh, the international interest also did go back to the original paper, to the conceptual uh, pattern, whilst the practical uh, aspects of uh, heterogeneity, uh, heterogeneity uh, and isotropy also, of course, were further developed. But uh, coming back to the original pattern that tickled the minds of uh, people working in peripheral disciplines like uh, geothermics, uh, uh, Domenico and Paltius gas, uh, then geochemical evolution of water, mm, uh, well, uh, back, and then also uh, Domenico and uh, Schwartz, uh, surface water, groundwater interaction, Tom Winter, and so on it went. Uh, actually, by 1978, I was trying to, I was thinking of applying it uh, to uranium uh, deposits, uh, the roll front type uranium deposits. I went to a AAPG conference in 1978 in Oklahoma City, where I, oh yeah, by that time, I uh, conceived of the uh, hydraulic theory of petroleum migration, and I went to, that was in 1978 in Oklahoma City. That's where I gave my first paper on that. But at the same time, there was a field trip organized by AAPG to uranium deposits in Oklahoma and, uh, and East Texas. And at one lunch, uh, as we had on the, uh, during the field trip, uh, Big tall men were standing beside me, well, behind me, if we were standing in line for lunch, and uh, we started to talk about uh, about my being there. And uh, uh, I told him that uh, my purpose of being here uh, was to find out if petroleum geologists have ever thought of linking regional groundwater flow patterns to uranium uh, accumulation, uranium deposits. And he shrugged his shoulders. He said, well, we know that a uh, uh, long time. And I said, what do you mean? Oh, yeah, uh, we are using it. And I said, well, who you are? Uh, who are you? Uh, Bill Galloway from the Texas Bureau of Economic Geology, formerly a uh, mining geologist in Wyoming, and indeed, in 1968, 1972, in Wyoming, they were already attributing uh, uh, roll front type uranium deposits uh, to these flow patterns. And then uh, I became good friends with uh, Bill Galloway, but at the same time, I abandoned uh, uh, the idea of me pursuing this line of uh, uh, inquiry simply because. Uh, that was just like with uh, Alan Fries. It was obvious that he knew the geochemistry, he knew the, mm, those aspects of your. Well, it was more work than one person could possibly do, right? Yeah. So we had ore deposits, we had petroleum deposits, soil salinization. Oh, that was another interesting thing, indeed, uh, the origin of saline. So that, was, uh, that came in very early, uh, in 1964, 63. I decided to a great extent at the advice and in competition with Peter Maybaum, who as being a, a full-blooded geologist, a field geologist, he wanted to understand the same question which, uh, uh, which led me uh, to the mathematical approach. Uh, he tried to answer those questions in the field by field observations, he, which he called groundwater outcrops. And this approach directed both of our thinking 
uh, to wet spots and uh, uh, soap holes, uh, soil mechanical <clears throat> irregularities, uh, quicksand basically it turned out. Mm. Uh, vegetation, so I was even for two or three years, I was uh, collecting plants very formally. You published papers uh, on yes. vegetation and, <clears throat> and groundwater and where indicators. I in the Trochu area that wherever mm, my water well uh, level distribution, that is the flow patterns based on water well levels, where, wherever they showed me in a discharge area, that's where. Uh, salinization of soils also occurred. And that perked up the interest of uh, Steve Pollock, uh, the soil geneticist uh, at the soils department of the University of Alberta. So that we went to work with several uh, master stu uh, students, two PhD students, and uh, could show without any, uh, uh, any difficult and problem uh, that indeed the genesis of the soil, uh, saline source that is linked to discharge of groundwater as uh, groundwater uh, picks up salts, uh, brings them to the surface, evaporates and there it is. So that a great number of uh, these uh, geological observations uh, were discovered up to the point that all of a sudden Somehow, it occurred to me, if this is all true, then groundwater must be a geologic agent, a general, universal geologic agent. Let's go back to, uh, so 19, you know, you've got the flow systems, uh, mines are award ceremony is held for the first time. Uh, Maybe can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, the day that the letter arrived and you found out that you were going to be uh, awarded the uh, the first ever uh, OE Mines or Award in Hydrogeology. And then the other question I think that many people aren't aware of is uh, just tell us a bit about the timing between when you got the Mines or Award and uh, when you got your PhD. Because I think many people read the famous Toth flow system diagrams and uh, haven't heard the whole story. Well, that was a, uh, 1965 was indeed a great uh, year for me. Uh, uh, that was a year when uh, I got the Mainzer Award. Uh, that was uh, the year of, uh, uh, of my PhD. And uh, that, uh, that was the day, uh, the year when uh, we became Fully fledged Canadian citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, the, so you got your PhD before or after the Mainzer Award? Uh, the, no, no, no. The PhD was a few months earlier. And the, at the end of this year, the end of 1963, uh, one central Alberta town by the name of Olds in my area of responsibility ran out of water. Period. Just ran out of water. They had to uh, to tank water into the town from a uh, river uh, 11 miles from the town. And, and then the town asked me and the government forced me to try to solve their problem, uh, problems. And then I decided to try in discharge areas to, for test drilling. The reason being that the geology was so heterogeneous there that there were no preferred aquifers. There was no uh, recognizable stratification. It's a floodplain deposit, Cretaceous floodplain deposit, Mars, uh, 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 shale, sandstone, sealstones, no stratification, no, as we later on came to call it, no hydrostratigraphy. Uh, and so I figured in such a situation, I cannot use geology to prefer any area. But in discharge areas where the water levels rise with increasing well depth, the available drawdown for pumping must be greater than in recharge areas where the uh, water levels decline with increasing well depth. So I started uh, my, I asked for uh, the town 
to give me enough money to drill three test holes, not asking why, how, and where. Yes, they were in such a straight uh, uh, jacket that uh, they uh, had to give me the permission. And lo and behold, the fir first well was a flowing well. And so that was a beautiful indication. And in, uh, I don't want to go into the details, but indeed it turned out to the point that uh, uh, in the discharge, uh, there I could dis uh, develop a well field uh, consisting of three fields. You never like to go there. <laughs> I remember because there were only casings sticking out. A couple out of casings sticking out of the ground in the bald prairie. That was it. <laughs> Yeah, but <laughs> the ne students never liked it. <clears throat> but never a drought year in the Baldur Prairie, because in the discharge area, the subsurface water supply was always good. And so that uh, there were o other signs of uh, little uh, uh, puddles and wetlands there. The ducks liked it uh, very much. Uh, so we developed there three. Uh, production wells, a well field, which uh, from which the water was uh, then uh, piped up, pumped up, uh, almost 50 meters higher on a uh, you know the uh, hill about eight kilometers. I have to uh, convert uh, <laughs> my. You don't have to convert. I mean, we, can, we work in kilometers now. Yeah. Right? Uh, so uh, that was that became my PhD thesis, because there I had to do the, uh, the actual exploration, all the drilling, some 30, uh, 34, 35 test holes, all the drilling, uh, all the pump, pump testing, uh, all the geochemistry, and there were very, very interesting evidences for different, originally natural different flow systems uh, mixing as a result of pumping, which could be shown geochemically. So I submitted that thesis to the University of Utrecht in Holland. So uh, I went back, and that's where I defended my PhD, because the European system was, I was already, when I left, uh, when I left Holland, I was what you could call a PhD without a thesis. So I did all the uh, mandatory co coursework, yeah. yes. You introduced hydrogeology as a course uh, to the University of Alberta in 1966, and maybe uh, you just want to comment about uh, you know what was what was that like to bring that into you know a university setting, and uh, obviously teaching has played a, a big role in your career. Can you just maybe tell us a little bit about uh, the early days of introducing hydrogeology to the university? It was a very intimidating experience for me because I had no teaching experience uh, before. Uh, I was, uh, I, uh, in those days, uh, from 1960 to 1980, I was employed at the Research, Research Council, Council of Alberta. Uh, but somehow the value of hydrogeology, that I think I can claim uh, without exaggeration, was recognized by the geology department at that time. And they asked. Who was the chairman at that time? Uh, Dr. Follensby, Follensby. Uh, Follensby, who was the, you know, the president of that International Geological Congress in 1972, uh, and a hard rock geologist, but he was, at, in those days, uh, uh, a guest professor, uh, uh, more than sabbatical, because for two or three years he was in Australia. Uh, he taught there and worked in Australia, uh, and uh, his deputy was uh, Gordon Williams. And Gordon Williams, who later on became instrumental in hiring Frank Schwartz, uh, Gordon Williams, uh, Williams liked that idea of uh, what I was doing, as, as well as he recognized that by that time I was uh, working together with the soil scientists uh, and some civil engineers, because of course soil mechanical problems, that was one thing we never mentioned that also became 
quite obviously related to groundwater flow, uh, slope stability, uh, uh, quicksand development. And Gordon Williams then asked me to teach uh, hydrogeology. But in those days, my prime experience was, was with the theory of flow systems. So uh, I, yeah, I, uh, I think I bored a good many people with uh, King Hubbard's theory and then my theory. And uh, a short part of that was only what people would have expected as hydrogeology. I realized that. And, but after four years, which you know, I you know, was teaching as an outsider, as an invited to a part time, um, <clears throat> I became, uh, I was uh, 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 appointed head of the groundwater department at the research. research council, and I just, I refused to give up research. I had to do the administration, and so teaching was the only dispensable aspect of my, I, I don't have the abilities to uh, work in three different lines uh, and do justice to it. So I gave up t uh, teaching. Two years, one of my colleagues took over. And after that, uh, Frank Schwartz did his PhD in Illinois under uh, uh, Pat Domenico. And P Pat Domenico, uh, we knew uh, each other very well. And Pat Domenico asked me if uh, there wouldn't be a place for Frank Schwartz. And we did the usual uh, recruiting process, <laughs> uh, and Frank uh, did. The rest is uh, history. For yeah. the, yes, for our uh, it was a lucky stroke for the uh, U of A that uh, Frank came there, and so I did introduce it, and in, uh, in, in, the, in those years, uh, 68, 66, 7, 8, 9, <clears throat> then. Uh, then uh, I was never satisfied with what you know, the job I had done uh, there. And in 1977, if I may tell, that was an interesting thing. By that time, I was fully and wholly uh, committed to petroleum hydrogeology. And I uh, attended to a petroleum hydrogeology short course, if you remember the name, Park Dickey. Uh, he wrote a textbook. He wrote, uh, if not two, geology, yes. Yeah. And I expected that now I will learn really all about it, what I uh, uh, didn't yet know. And it, I was very disappointed, very disappointed. It was all mm, water chemistry and no uh, Hubbardian background and understanding. So right from the hotel in uh, Calgary, I picked up the phone and called the head of uh, the chairman of the geology department in Calgary, whom I didn't even know. I just asked for the chairman. <laughs> I didn't know him. I didn't know who he was or what his specialty was. Later, on, I found out uh, at Cloven. Yeah. I picked up the phone introduced myself, told him why I was here in Calgary to learn at the petroleum capital of uh, Canada, and why I was here, and what I hear here under the term hydrogeology, but hydrogeology applied to petroleum geology is atrocious. <laughs> I was re very upset, and I said, you guys here must introduce hydrogeology. And he was game enough, he said, well, Come over, let's have a talk, which I did. Then uh, write a syllabus, uh, what you would teach, and then we will discuss it uh, the, uh, the, uh, the department. And to make a short story, uh, a long story short, uh, they gave me, all right, uh, come over. And, uh, and uh, so in 1978 and 1979, I commuted. Uh, both years uh, half term, a full uh, one one term, and it 
played so well out with the students, among the students, that uh, they decided then right away that it will be introduced and for a few years. Uh, then they had to create a full position for it. But, uh, well, you know, the resident, uh, Larry Bentley, and you know, the, uh, arrived. So by that time, I, I felt good about my courses. We just got up to talking about uh, when you joined the University of Alberta in 1980. So you were supervising graduate students before you officially became a, a professor in 1980. Can you just maybe tell us a bit about that? I had you know, my first graduate student. Uh, he graduated in 1966, I believe, uh, Roger Clissold, and uh, he uh, worked indeed uh, in those days. Uh, uh, I think it must be understood that in those days, mm, I was with my own theory uh, that it's beautiful on paper, but let's see uh, verifications in nature. And the first some uh, road was is to see if indeed. Uh, measured flow patterns, ba or at least flow patterns based on hydraulics, that is, groundwater levels, uh, would result in those field observations, uh, like we, uh, we already have mentioned, uh, uh, groundwater outcrops, uh, wetlands, uh, saline soils, uh, uh, soil pools, etc., etc. And one practical objective of, of, or hope of that work was to see if this groundwater mapping, field mapping of groundwater outcrops could be used uh, to uh, predict groundwater conditions in terms of uh, the productivity, what kind of water you will have. And uh, Roger Clissold was uh, the first one who uh, tried this, uh, this uh, idea and this method of field mapping of groundwater in the Red Deer area. I'll never forget, uh, I learned at that time also another very important thing, which is basically don't, don't get scared if your predictions aren't proven right, right away. Because I asked Roger to go out for that study area, several square uh, miles, uh, go out to that uh, study area and look for saline sores and some soap holes or so on. And he went out, a very diligent person, hardworking, intelligent. He went out, looked around, and uh, two weeks later he came back very disappointed. He didn't find any. Any, any saline sores. You found some wet spots, but no saline sores. I became a bit concerned at that, so I went out with him for several days, uh, looked around, and indeed no saline sores. But as you were walking in the field, uh, uh, looking at some springs and so on, and see that, that spring water is how nice and clear and now, with some chemical approximations of total dissolved soil, then it occurred to me, it may, the lack of saline sores may mean that the water is just so good, so, uh, so low in total dissolved solids, that there is really nothing to be left behind evaporation. Uh, the ultimate result of, uh, one of the results of his uh, master thesis proved it out perfectly. There was good enough water, good enough flow, not too much bentonite in the soil, so that the water quality was good. And that was the only reason for not having saline sores. That was a supposition that if there is discharge, there must be salinity. It ain't so. Now, if the water is good enough, then uh, you won't have it. So th that was a lesson for me that I shouldn't get scared just because 
it doesn't work. Uh, the U prediction is not true. Instead, it may show an anomaly that otherwise is not revealed. And the very same thing, the very same philosophy, very same uh, thinking, and I proved out with Kaushik rocket later on with the potentiometric anomalies. There is a real a thinking behind, behind it, and valid in my opinion, thinking behind using anomalies as indicators of something that you had not previously thought about. You know, so you've had, you obviously enjoy teaching uh, an immense amount. It's been very important to you over your career. Oh, uh, yes, uh, very much so. I, uh, I have always liked to work with uh, young and preferably bright people. Uh, actually, uh, the way I got back to uh, the university was that I, in the late 1970s, the whole management and direct, uh, direct direction of the Research Council of Alberta changed fundamentally. And I remember I didn't like that idea at all. Uh, so I asked the new president, uh, uh, Dr. Cloutier, out of Quebec, uh, uh, do you want me to be a research director or a manage manager? Uh, he couldn't answer me the question. I told him two years from today, I will come back because I realize you are in a new job, you uh, don't know how. So two years later, on the day, I uh, went into his office and I uh, asked Dr. Kutti, you know, you have had two years, do you still know? And he was still having and hawing. And then rather abruptly I said, well, uh, Dr. Kutti, I've resigned. And then I, when I got back to the door or out the door, then I realized, what now? Somebody in, the, uh, in uh, some of the government departments heard that I was going to leave. And they, the, our, uh, they gave the geology department a five-year contract money. And they offered me a, a job as well. Uh, I got job offers from the other two places, but uh, they uh, gave me. Uh, I said, well, this way I just have to move from one building to the other. And that's how I got first on a five-year contract uh, to the university. Obviously, the field of hydrogeology has changed a little bit since the 1960s to today. We have more journals, more people, more conferences, more pressures. And specifically teaching hydrogeology, I know you uh, have had a fair 40-year, 40 45-year period to see it change through your career. And what do you think um, are the challenges or the you know th things that challenges today we're, we're teaching hydrogeology to the, the new generation? I think that one of the first, one of the most difficult things for a newcomer in this uh, uh, this area, or even for the old timer, is to separate the wheat from the chaff, because with this. Uh, exponential increase in publications, you get so much third rate or garbage to call a spade a spade, that even just to go through the lists, mm -hmm. that is very difficult. Uh, in the old days, there were third rate material uh, as well. But in those days, uh, those days uh, you could I did at least pick out five, eight, ten journals in different disciplines and just read every month the table of comments and uh, much fewer materials. So one problem is, one challenge, how to read the, the material worthy of being read. I mean, Frank Schwartz has written quite extensively about this idea of, uh, you know, as the, as the discipline matured, have we done it all? Uh, you know, what um, maybe you want to comment on? Where do you see uh, some of the big challenges in hydrogeology in the future? The biggest challenge is to update the definition of the science, to keep 
the definition of the science, in this case hydrogeology, updated and realized that hydrogeology now is not the same as, for instance, when I started, and it was not the same as, let's say, in the 1920s, or is not the, uh, or not the same as uh, Schuller's time uh, in the 1960s. I think that uh, this French book was the Bible. The term is changing as the time goes on, and I think a very major change took, took place by the 1980s. And that from there on, what before that time, earlier before the 1980s, I looked at, uh, or I still look at, hydrogeology as traveling parallel alongside, side by side, along two routes. One, uh, the scientific, the natural scientific approach, the other, the engineering approach. And then natural scientists, very much to the credit of the flow system idea, even, even if I say so, we started to think in terms of basin of flow system, basin of flow matters, and came through one recognition, one discovery after the other, to the conclusion, uh, these were my first, not my personal, but the first field verifications of the flow system idea. We came to the conclusions that there are no aquicludes, but that everything is leaking. And that idea came in sometimes in, let's say, the, between the 1960s, late 1960s and the 1970s, and late 1970s. But by 1980, there was no question that we can and have to talk about uh, basin or scale hydraulic continuity. These two concepts two approaches on the, from the basinal side and from the uh, stratified uh, hydrostratigraphic units uh, became, we realized that they are the two, uh, they are the same things uh, uh, expressed in two different ways. And the convergence of these two initially uh, independent and individual concepts merged by 1980. So from there on, I look at hydrogeology and I call it as the modern hydrogeology when there is no difference between the engineering hydrogeologist and the basinal hydrogeologist and whatever includes it. Mm. And I think that from that point of view, uh, we, uh, hydrogeology has really changed from uh, the times before the 1960s. And I think that here in this modern hydrogeology, we can't expect in this in this area in modern hydrogeology we cannot expect fundamental conceptual breakthroughs. Instead, what I predict and expect is the hyphenation, the development of the hyphenated hydrogeologies environmental hydrogeology, contaminant hydrogeology, petroleum hydrogeology. This is a fairly natural way of developing in the natural sciences, that sciences merge uh, interdisciplinarily, scientists merge, then go as a tree stump, or grow together, or stem, and, and then they branch out into individual sciences, which again individually grows for a while, and then again together, the, but it becomes uh, wider and wider. The greatest challenge, in my opinion, is to keep abreast with it and provide the appropriate education so that, or the, that the new generation have has the flexibility, members of the new generation have the flexibility to adjust to whatever new challenge comes up.
you know, obviously you've had a, a very long and very productive career with uh, field work and publications and being a manager and being an instructor part time. And um, I mean, the obvious question is where do you get all the, uh, the energy to do something like that? And maybe part of it is uh, the fact that you I enjoy it. I think it's just that uh, you enjoy what you are doing. Uh, one very important aspect which you somehow uh, didn't come out uh, but was revived last night by me by looking at the president of uh, GSA, uh, Dr. Uh, Sharp, uh, that he tried to show how enjoyable it is to work in different parts of the world. Well, I couldn't agree more because that's uh, what we somehow didn't touch upon that I had the good luck to work uh, virtually in every part of the world. Um, Europe, different countries in Europe, different parts of uh, North America, Mexico included, uh, in the Far East, in India, in Africa, in Thai, uh, Thailand, uh, uh, all over the place. And you can use this broad experience, feel experience, what you have, what you picked up somewhere, you can use at another place. And that is a very, very important aspect to keep your mind fresh and uh, perhaps uh, indeed uh, generate some energy. Would you do anything differently? Would you have done, you know, if you had to make a choice, 1960 to go to the Netherlands or go to Canada, you know, look back and said, regrets, no regrets, uh, anything that you'd want to do over on, you know, the word. Uh, I think that no, professionally, uh, that sometimes, sometimes it was very difficult, uh, as I referred to it or uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, I went against my father's will, my mother's will. I took the risk uh, to go to the steel factory and I was lucky. So that there were risks, and, but I never regret that I have taken. What do, you, what do you most want to be remembered for? He recognized some truth of nature that when put into practice served the betterment of mankind. I, th I, I think that that is how I would summarize it. Well, on behalf of the International Association of Hydrogeology, Joel, thank you very much for spending your time and uh, talking you. with us and uh, hope that people enjoy it. Thanks very much. Thank you.